Samer. Good evening. Um, my name is Samer Hassan, and on behalf of Dr. Ranjan Gupta, we are uh, co-chair and chair of the Education Committee, re respectively. We welcome you to tonight's uh, session, uh, building your team and setting up your uh, and setting up your practice. This is part of an eight series, um, uh, uh, eight session series uh, on practice management. That's part of the ASES Virtual Fellows Core Curriculum. And I'd like to pass the torch to Dr. Bill Levine, uh, immediate past president of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons. Great, thanks very much, Samer. Thanks, Ranjan and, and ASCS for doing this. Um, uh, tonight's session is um, supported by Depew Synthes. And so we have a quick video to show. Developing the future leaders of tomorrow is our priority today. Depew Synthes Future Leaders is a comprehensive educational program developed for today's orthopedic residents and fellows. Online, anytime, anywhere education modules when you need to prepare. From wound closure to complex revision surgeries, we have you covered. Content and curricula align with current ABOS and ACGME milestones. Our in-person and virtual clinical skills building programs allow learners to apply their knowledge, enhance their skills, engage with key faculty facilitators, and connect with peers. Not able to get away? Well, learners can build skills prior to entering the OR through our virtual reality systems. With 14 cross-specialty modules currently available, learners can gain an understanding of the instruments and procedures simulating a real-world experience. The new Future Leaders app is where you can find the latest calendar of educational events, access our Dubs and Scrubs podcast series focused on women in orthopedics, and find quick hitting snippets of clinical information. We know time is limited. The app is your quick access to information when you need it most. At Depew Synthes, we are transforming the future of surgery, committed to advancing patient care, and focused on developing the future leaders in orthopedics. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Depew Synthes, for helping. Uh, we have a great faculty tonight. Uh, we have John Sperling, um, who did his residency at Mayo, uh, fellowship at HSS, and has been at Mayo ever since. Uh, he has defied the odds of leaving your first job. Mike Ryway uh, from Cincinnati, then Columbia, and has been at OrthoCincy since 2010. And Mike Knutson, uh, graduated from Minnesota, did his fellowship at Columbia, and then he went back to Minnesota, which is also in his first job. So we thought we would pick three faculty members from three different generations so we could get their perspective. This is our agenda. We're going to talk about before you sign the contract, the uh, office management, your keys to your success, OR keys to your success, research keys to your success, and if you could do it all over again, what might you change? So I'm going to stop my share. And um, get this up and get this up. And uh, Ron John, welcome. How are you? Thanks for thanks for being here. I know it was a hard day. <laughs> thanks, Bill. Sorry, just had Wi-Fi connections issues. Oh, no worries, no worries. All right. So um, before you sign your contract, three keys to success: Mike Knutson, your personal staff, secretary, MA, nurse practitioner, PA. Uh, how the heck do you start? Yeah, it's a really good question, and I think it's really important to understand and establish this before you sign. But ideally, if you can get some form of administrative assistant secretary, secretary help, it's great. Usually when you're starting, it's going to be split between you and a number of other surgeons in a group practice or in an academic practice. But having that administrative assistant can be really helpful, uh, handling paperwork and patient phone calls. Your rooming staff, you're looking for some form of consistency, whether that's an MA or an ATC you really want to make sure that you have some form of consistent help in your clinic so that you are delivering a consistent message to your patients. And then in the operating room, whether you're in academic practice or private practice, you want to make sure that you have, again, some form of consistent coverage. Otherwise, you'll find out that the one PA that's split with you and another surgeon, when they go on vacation for a few weeks, you find that you're doing total shoulders with the scrub tech because you didn't establish a contingency plan before you signed your contract, which is hard. Uh, and so you really want to try to hammer out some of these details, I think, before you sign to really establish a plan of attack. 
Mike, thanks. Mike Ryway, you know, this is, we're talking about before you get there. So kind of pre-op planning here, um, office versus OR. Do you get a say in that? Do they split the day at the place you're joining? Do you get a full day in the OR? Do you get block time or they tell you you got to get busy before? What, if you're looking at jobs right now, what, how should you be viewing those issues? Yeah, those are all, I think, important priorities. And, you know, if, if you can establish some block time, it's nice to have that because it just, you know, you get some set schedule. Obviously, you know, you need your office time to be able to stay busy in the OR. So making sure you have two to three days of clinic time, I think is really important. And then, you know, whether or not you have a half day or a full day of office or clinic, you know, my preference, I think, is to go full day. And the reason is, is, you know, as a shoulder surgeon, I think you have a lot of turnover time, you know, to sit up and get the patient prepped and things like that. And to be able to be efficient, it's really hard to do that in a half day. So I kind of, my vote is sort of a full day and try to get that block time ahead of time. John, John Sperling, you trained at HSS. Uh, you did a lot of Biomet because your mentors were Biomet. Now you're gonna go join a practice um, do you get to say that you want to use Biomed or what if they only use Right Medical? How do you know what preferences cards to give the new ORs? You know, give us your words of wisdom on thinking ahead from an OR perspective. There's something that our fellows, you know, they show up all the time and you, they got everything they need, yep. but now you're going to go to a new place. So give, give us a couple of pearls. Yeah, I think you have to position yourself for success. And I think Evan Flato was the one who said when you start a job that they're not going to give you everything you ask for, uh, but you need to make sure that you ask for things. And particularly your preference cards, if there's specific equipment that you want or implants, it takes some advanced time. So at Mayo Clinic, that can, process can take two or three months. But at our institution, it really is the time where you actually do have the maximum leverage. They want to support you. They want you to be successful. So really articulating exactly what you want in that operating room when you start day one so you're comfortable, so you're successful is critical. Thanks, John. All right, guys. So we're transitioned now. We're in our new job. And now we're going to talk about what are our keys to success office management, seeing patients, becoming efficient. Uh, becoming an expert in our field. So Mike Ryway, should you limit the type of patient or pathology that you see in the office? You did a shoulder fellowship. I want to do 100% shoulder and elbow. Should I limit that right out of the gate or how, how do I handle that, Mike? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely tempting, Bill, to do that because, you know, you did your fellowship. You want to hone into your uh, shoulder elbow, you know, practice right away. But you know, ultimately what's going to help your practice the most in your community is word of mouth. And if you take all comers, it, it's, there's no better way to build your practice, you know, and, and um, being good to your patients, just being a good physician to them helps to spread that word of mouth. And uh, to me, I, I wouldn't limit yourself because ultimately, right, right when you start, you're just not going to have a full schedule. So you just try to get as much as you can. Um, and then you can refer out what you're not comfortable with, but take great care of those patients that come in the first time. And, and, um, and that'll really help build your brand inside your community. And uh, just a, a follow up to that, Mike Gryway, how do you handle the difficult case? You want to establish yourself, but you know, your first week in practice, it's a seven time revision reverse that's got instability. Do you take that on by yourself or do you ask for some help? Yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of uh, finding that great mentor, um, you know, close to you that you can, you can lean on when you need them. And that, that case particularly is one that that you're going to want to, you know, lean on them, maybe get, you know, help in the operating room, maybe you refer that patient on to them and you, you, you know, assist them, uh, whatever the case may be, but, but, you know, you don't want to tackle that necessarily, you know, your first week in office. Uh, and sometimes those are the patients you're going to get, right. You, you get the, the ones that um, people have been waiting for you to get uh, to come to you. So, um, but having somebody that can, that can work with you on those is important. Awesome. Uh, Mike Knudsen. Kind of a quantity versus quality question. You're first starting, how many minutes do you tell your appointment schedulers to give you for a new patient, for a follow-up patient, um, for a post-op patient? What, what should we tell them? Yeah, same thing. You want quality here when you're starting out. And so taking your time will help you build a rapport as a good physician, a good orthopedic surgeon. So I would recommend a minimum of 30 minutes for your new patient visits when you are first starting until you really get in the swing of things. 
follow-ups and post-ops, probably 15 minutes, just so that you are again, establishing a consistent, clear amount of time with your patients longer if you feel like you need it. Because when you are first starting out, you will be slow. And so using that time effectively early on will really go a long way to building excellent word of mouth um, uh, reputation for you as a surgeon. So now you're getting a little bit more comfortable, Michael. You're, you're in practice, let's say a year, year and a half. You've got a PA there or a physician extender that's working with you. When do you start uh, giving up some of that micromanagement? You say, you know, maybe I can have my uh, extender see my first post-op uh, patient at the two-week point. And a realistic um, uh, answer to that would be that once you're outside of your board collection, frankly, is when you should start considering doing that. But during your board collection, especially, and, and when you're first starting out, your two-week follow-ups should see you. Uh, you can start to spread that out a little bit as you get busier and as you are moving out of your board collection phase. I think then it becomes more appropriate to do that. And you can also task them with doing injections or other smaller management decision things moving on. John, I'm joining Mayo, um, and do I just follow in line, or can I personalize my office uh, in any way? How, how do you handle that, you know, um, just do what we do, or I've got some ideas that maybe might be different? Yeah, Bill, I think it's good to have some ideas on what's different, and I think a key, coming back to a place like Mayo, 1,600 physicians, huge, huge, huge patient population as well, I think articulating a clear message of the patients also that you're interested in and what uh, differentiates perhaps your practice from others is important. Getting that word out and then perhaps setting up your practice to accommodate that. Great. Mike Ryway, how do I know when I'm ready to hire a physician extender? That's a great question. I, I battled that for a long time before I, you know, got my first position extender. And I think the, um, the, the key answer is, you know, it's really one of these things where you're either so busy that you can't really attend to your life priorities or your work priorities very well. Um, but it's, it's something where, you know, you're, you're out of balance somehow. And, um, and typically that's from, you know, the workload or, or whatever the case may be. But Position extenders aren't always right for everybody. And, you know, you have to decide, you know, yourself whether that's the right decision for you. Um, but to me, it's about a balance and the priorities that you have in life and whether or not you're able to keep those, um, you know, by yourself with your, with your own practice. And Mike Knutson, how do you maximize efficiency of using an extender in your practice? Honestly, how, do you, still, how do you justify it? Yeah, honestly, I'm still trying to figure that one out. And so if my senior colleagues can provide more insight on that, I would love to know. Um, but I am still playing with it and using them in more and more means now that I am outside of my board collection. And, and uh, like I said, I'm using them for injections. I'm using them for some of my follow-ups and whatnot. I, I can tell you that a lot of my faculty, you know, I've, I've hired a lot of faculty and it's a little bit of the me too phenomenon. Somebody sees someone with a nurse practitioner and they say, hey, I want one of those. Except that if they have to pay for the, P, the bottom line for that nurse practitioner, they often get a little less enthusiastic. So a lot of this is gonna be based on the finances, of course, no question about that. John, does it matter whether you have an MA, a PA, an RN, an NP, an ATC? How, how should a young uh, faculty or young uh, uh, surgeon coming out of fellowship even decide uh, which type they should think about? That's uh, a great question, Bill. I think leaning on some of your partners, found out what's been successful for them, what may be helpful in a peds ortho practice, maybe different than a sports oriented or a shoulder and elbow practice. But I think the relationship with the person you hire in that role is absolutely critical. I've been fortunate here 21 years. I've had two PAs, one retired, and now I'm with uh, Bernie Morey's former PA. So if you hire someone who has huge experience coming into it with you and has 20 years experience and you're starting out and they know all the relationships, they know the referring physicians, that can be an enormous advantage for you starting out. Great advice. Mike Ryway, I know this has never happened to you, but let's just say you happen <laughs> to be an hour and a half behind in office hours. How do you manage the stress and give us some practical tips on what you do? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, they don't teach you stress management in medical school, you know, and, um, and I think that that was one of the first shocks was getting to practice and you're getting busier. And then all of a sudden you're running like an hour behind and, and what do you do? And 
Um, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things that I, uh, I do. Um, number one, I definitely, I'll go out sometimes even personally, like if I'm really far behind, I'll go out personally and tell the patients in the waiting room in my area of the pod, look, I'm sorry, I'm running behind. Here's the reason why. And, you know, uh, hopefully there's a valid excuse for me to be late and just tell them, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but we'll definitely get to you. And, uh, you know, to me, when patients hear from you, that really makes a difference. Now, sometimes you just can't and you have your MA go out or a manager go out and talk to the patients, but definitely communicate. I think that's key. Um, and then, you know, secondly, you got to just take it one patient at a time. And I would say this, you know, remember that patients will definitely forgive you for running late, but they'll never forget the time that you blew them off because you're running late and, um, and you tried to rush them through the office visit. So try your very best to just sort of stay cool, calm and collected. And, uh, you'll, you know, you'll get through it. It's just one patient at a time, but you know, those are my practical tips there. That's, that's a tough one. Thanks, Mike. Mike Knudsen, um, you're starting out in practice, you know, your first year, and unfortunately, your first complication shows up in the office. Take us through that process. How'd you handle that, Mike? Yeah, speaking of cool, calm, and collected, that's the time to be it. Um, take a deep breath, because you're going to have complications. It's going to happen to you. And so take a deep breath. Phone a friend if you need to, depending on the severity of the complications. Phone a mentor. Phone whoever you can get a hold of. Talk it through. And then go in and see the patient and be a human being. Leave your ego at the door and make sure that you validate their experience and whatever they're going through with the complication. And then come at it objectively and find a solution to their complication and help them through it, whether that's a revision surgery or whether that's you know, referral out, whatever you need to have done that's in the best interest of that patient to make sure that you are not abandoning them. Um, it's hard when you start seeing your own complications come back but I think that if you come at it from a very human approach, you can't go wrong. So John, uh, you know, you've got a lot more experience um, than the two mics, but now you have a complication that comes in. How do you, it, has it changed over the years? Uh, does, do you still get that pit in your stomach? Uh, how do you handle it, John? Yeah, I think Mike said it really well. You know, I think the main thing I try to communicate is to the patient that I made a commitment to them. I'll do whatever I can to help them and that we'll get through this together. And I tell them, I say, look, I'm booked out months at a time. I'm gonna add you on, we're gonna get this thing done. I'll do whatever I have to do to get through this together. And then the other thing I try to do is I try to reach out to them then. So let's say I did the revision, and then the next week, I'll make sure I call them personally myself and say, look, I wanna check on you. I was thinking of you. I wanna make sure you're doing okay with this. Please let me know if you have any problems. And I think Mike said it very well, I think, just ensuring that they know that you care and that you're committing to them is, is really critical. Bill, I'd love to hear from you. I know you're moderating, but I got, got to get you involved in this. Love to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, I think you guys are nailing it. I mean, you know, it's the personal touch. Uh, I was going to say to Mike Griway, if you send your MA out to tell them that you're running an hour and a half behind, make sure they have body armor. Um, because <laughs> That's true. Because there's, isn't it amazing how patients treat uh, our staff so much differently than they'll treat the doctors? Uh, it's kind of embarrassing sometimes how, how rude they might be uh, and then be very nice to you. Uh, but no, I, I think, uh, you know, candor, be, when, when doctors and especially orthopedic surgeons show humility and show decency and humanity, it goes a long way. You, you're going to still have people that might be very upset with you. They might sue you. All of that's true. But the reality is every study shows that the worst thing you can do is be arrogant, deny, blame someone else, uh, or certainly blame the patient. And all of those things will 100% lead to medical legal situations that we don't wanna be in. Uh, so thanks. Um, Mike um, Griway, you hired a physician extender and they're not working out and you know it. Do you put in more time and energy or just pull the plug? How do you decide? It's a great question. I think the first thing, um, you know, that good leaders, you know, try to do is they, they, they will notice that somebody is not performing up to their expectations. And hopefully you reach out and you say, hey, you know, is there something going on at home or, you know, what is the reason for, you know, why this person's not performing? If they have performance issues or whatever, uh, addressing that I think is important and obviously give them time. Uh, but a lot of people have things going on at home, you know, in their personal life financially, whatever the case may be. And so trying to understand that I think is, is important. 
But that being said, let's say, you know, you, you find out that there, there really isn't anything going on. If there's, you know, performance issues to me, um, you want to move on quickly from that situation. You don't want to linger um, and let that draw out because ultimately it just affects, you know, um, the whole office uh, when that happens. So to me, you, you hire slowly and um, fire quickly in that situation. The only thing I would add to that, especially if you're in a in an academic practice, um, make sure you get your HR team involved very quickly and early, because sometimes you might want to fire somebody and you find out you can't, and there may have to be a, a shift of that position to somewhere else. So they might not have to work with you, and you, but you might have to keep them in your organization. So um, get HR involved early and often if you're having difficulties with any of your staff. Uh, Mike Knudsen, uh, you're seeing a patient, they clearly need surgery. You're early in your practice. How do you maximize your efficiency and certainty of ensuring that the patient actually schedules surgery with you? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so I think that this is where really building uh, your team around you, including the physical therapists that you work with, the non-operative sports medicine docs, your, your own athletic trainers, groomers, you want everybody singing your praises that comes into contact with that patient first and foremost. And then from a more pragmatic standpoint, one of the best things that ever happened to me was that my surgical scheduler is just down the hall from me. And so my athletic trainer brings the patient to them to schedule their surgery on the day that they, they come in and are indicated for the operation. And so they get a date of their surgery before they even leave the building. And so from a very practical standpoint, that's very helpful if that's possible. Now, not every practice is gonna have that, but it is a is it found to be a very helpful tip for me. That that is brilliant if you can do that. Uh, some patients will need to think about it a little bit more than that, but certainly if you can, I think that's a, a great strategy. Um, Ranjan and Samer, we're we're at the coming to the end of the office part of this. Do you have do you guys have any questions for our faculty, or are there any questions from the chat room about office management? We're gonna we're gonna segue to the OR after this. No, no, no questions from the uh, audience, but I think it bears because uh, Bill, you and I and Sam have mentored all of us, some younger folks, I think a little bit more about what do you do with the challenging patient that you don't want to operate on, even though they okay. have an, even though they have a surgical indication, should you operate on that challenging patient? Thanks. Uh, that's a great question. John, let's start with you with this, the senior experience, and then we'll go mid-range to Gryway and then to Mike Knudsen. Yeah, it's a great question, Ron, John. And, and, you know, my approach, maybe it's the New Yorker in me, is really just try to have very honest and direct conversation with that patient. And I think it's okay to know, one of my senior partners taught me this early on in practice. It's okay at some point, if you and the patient are not going to get along, to acknowledge that and to let them know that and refer them on to for another opinion. So I think there are people you see that would benefit from surgery, but obviously the relationship itself is not going to work out that way. Mike Graway, any, anything different than that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. In fact, I battle this um, you know, pretty frequently in the office. A lot of times there is a surgical need, but you know, maybe the patient has um, some factors that are gonna have them perform poorly, you know, and, and you've identified that. And I think, dealing with that directly with them, um, whatever that particular issue is, uh, and say, hey, look, I need you to solve X, Y, or Z before we consider an operation. And I'm gonna give you six months to do that. To me, a lot of times patients may come with, you know, narcotic issues or alcoholism or psychiatric issues that, that are, you know, are, are tough for them to deal with. And, and I try to at least address it with them and, um, and have them try to um, make, some, make some improvements on at least the alcohol and drug issues. Mike Knudsen? Yeah, those are, you You both nailed it uh, from my standpoint. And the other thing is I would say is that you have to remember that it is okay to say no uh, to the patient and say that you don't feel comfortable. And if they disagree with you, I mean, do they really wanna have surgery with you if you two aren't agreeing on whether or not they need the surgery or should have the surgery? And so um, other than, the points that they mentioned, I think it is okay, especially when you're early to say no. I mean, if you lose that one patient, it's not gonna break your practice. Yeah, I think, you know, it's something that you guys know I, I've tried to teach to our fellows and residents for over the years that 
there is no, nothing on God's earth that says that you have to operate on any patient anytime. I mean, if it's, if it's a life or death situation, obviously, but short of that, if there is an elective problem in your office and you're not comfortable for whatever reason, uh, then you can certainly give them names of other orthopedic surgeons. Uh, you can uh, help refer them. You can do a lot of things, but nobody's going to put a gun to your head and say you have to operate on a patient. I think that's important because we all feel the pressure to get busy, to get work RV used because of productivity uh, bonuses, et cetera. But don't be afraid to just say no. I think that's a great, great advice, Mike. All right, we're going to transition to the OR, keys to success. John Sperling, how do I create a team in the OR? Same scrub nurse, same core group. Can I do that if they haven't had that type of system in my hospital historically? Um, really key points of, of building a surg surgical practice and your surgical confidence. Take us through that, John. Yeah, that it's essential. And I think that can even start before you take the job. Obviously, if you're going back to where you trained at some point, that's the groundwork you wanna lay before you get back there to have perhaps the people positioned well for you. I think even understanding uh, the operating room day you're on at Mayo, we alternate days. Who's the staff that's gonna be on that day? Who are the other partners you're going to have around? But at the end of the day, as your practice matures, there's no doubt that it plays a huge part, not only the efficiency of the operating room, but the enjoyment of going to work every day. Mike Ryway, I'm just starting out. I'm nervous about asking for help. Second surgeon scrub, how do I navigate that? That's a really good question. I, I like the second surgeon scrub a lot, um, particularly when you're, you know, entering into a difficult case or, you know, you've got a, um, something that you haven't done for, the, for, uh, for a while and maybe it's the first time you're doing it in practice. Um, most importantly, that other surgeon, he remembers what it's like when, you, when he first started, he or she first started. So, uh, you know, remember that and asking for a second scrub is never, you know, showing weakness. Um, you just want to put your ego aside um, you know, and that, that really um, increases respect, honestly, from your colleagues. Um, you know, I always respect the surgeon more for saying, hey, I got this case coming up. Um, can you give me a hand? And I know that I did that when I, um, when I was in practice. So, um, you know, you want to identify who it is that you're going to need help from um, and then schedule that a case, you know, way ahead of time. Make sure that you guys both get on the same page. A lot of times it's better to do that case either, you know, first part of the day or the end of the day so you can both be there. Um, so those are, those are the things that I think about when, whenever I'm, I'm working with another surgeon, but that's a good question. Thanks. Mike Knudsen, you're just starting out. How do I incorporate my mentors into practice? Do I rely on my fellowship mentors, my residency mentors, my practice mentors? Take us through your nav your navigation. You're on mute, Mike. My apologies. I would recommend staying in touch with every mentor that you can if possible. And so keeping open lines of communication with your residency mentors, your fellowship mentors, and then establishing practice mentors and friends help make this job more fun too. So like if you're bouncing cases off your fellowship mentors or your residency mentors, or heck, even people that you trained with previously. So when I have a tough calcaneus fracture or an Achilles tendon laceration, I will reach out to my friends in foot and ankle surgery to bounce cases off them and get their insight and advice. I think that the more people that you connect with consistently to talk about cases makes you a better surgeon because you're getting more input from more of these um, different backgrounds. Thanks. John, Sp I'm gonna ask each of you guys the following question. So think about it. John Sperling, you wanna create a winning environment in the OR? What are your three top pearls? Yeah, I, I think it's one that uh, you're, open to suggestions from the team. I think a low stress environment is key. So whatever you need to do in that regard, I think is, is very, very important. Uh, and I would just say, just be kind and nice to the people you work with. That, that's probably the most important thing that goes a long way. Mike Ryway. Um, yeah, so I think having like, um, you know, telling people thank you, I think is really important. So, you know, you finish up your day, you say thank you. Having team huddles, um, you know, before you start your day, if you get a long day, is important. You know, just getting everybody on the same page, and then um, just showing your character and and you know trying to be uh, be a good surgeon for your patients and always kind of having like that that good um, good nature about you is is really important. And how you handle sort of the difficulties really, I think, galvanizes you with your team 
And, um, you know, if you can dig in on a tough case and you don't, um, you know, get upset, that really shows them you're a good, you're a good leader, somebody they want to want to be working with. Mike Knudsen. Yeah. So I think that as a brand new surgeon entering the realm, one of the most important things early on is to clearly communicate everything that you need and expect from the OR ahead of time, because the way you did it in fellowship is likely not the way that they do it at that surgery center that you're going to. And so if you are clear and explicit about everything that you need ahead of time, that'll help make things run very smoothly first and foremost. And then when you get to the OR on your date of surgery, make sure you learn everyone's name, the CRNA, the scrub tech, the, just learn their name and use their name, show them that human decency and respect, and then make sure that you're praising them and thanking them throughout the case to make that kind of human connection too. That goes such a long way with building a positive working environment where people aren't afraid to speak up and then they go to bat for you and then they open up to you uh, and then they say good things about you when you're not there, which really, really, really helps. Um, and then just being patient in the early going because they're not gonna have all the instruments that you wanted for your case every single time. And so just exercising patience, taking your ego out of the equation and being a good surgeon and human being to be around really goes a long way. John, thanks. John, uh, the Arthrex rep takes you aside and says they've got a new product in the OR and they want you to, you've never seen it before, they want you to use it. How do you manage that as a new surgeon? Yeah, so I, I run our committee at Mayo for all the new devices coming in and you can see people have different perspectives on this. I think one of the important things is we all only have so much dry powder when it comes to asking for equipment and implants. So you want to use, make sure you use that effectively. So I would really try to understand what are the benefits of that product? How does it compare to what I currently use? So when you ask your chair for that or you ask the nurse manager, you're making sure that it's something you're truly interested in getting. Thank you. Mike Ryway, uh, your first week in practice, your intra-op, you get a complication. How do you manage that situation in real time? Great question. Um, I think, you know, everybody fears complications, especially the intra-op complications. And, um, you know, the first thing is remember, you know, is somebody that, um, you know, you may be, that may be able to help you. It's just a phone call away. So, you know, you call, you phone a friend sometimes. So, you know, pick up the phone. Um, I remember I, I've called a surgeon intra-op before and it was probably one of the better things I did. Um, and, you know, it certainly helped me get out of a jam. You know, sometimes you may have surgeons operating next to you, um, like in adjacent ORs, you know, it's okay to call them and, and see if they'll come in and help you as well. Um, sometimes you got to react quickly. Um, I remember a case where um, I started having cement extravasation um, below like a, uh, a hemiarthroplasty was loose. I got a CT scan, didn't look like there were any issues there. And I started putting the cement in and all of a sudden, you know, x-ray showed uh, my, my C arm picture showed that there was cement extravasating posterior in the arm distally uh, right around the radial nerve. So I quickly had to make an incision there and, and basically get that cement out before it hardened. And, uh, you know, that was just a reaction type of move. And, and there are, you know, those things that need to happen quickly and that's tough, but try to think about all the potential bad things that can happen to you because they will and try to prepare for that beforehand. Um, you just never know what you're going to come up against, but if you're ready to make, um, you know, incision, maybe, you know, you got to take down the strap muscles for whatever reason, get to a bleeder, you know, be prepared to do that, practice that in the lab, you know, things like that, really critical um, things that you may have to do. Um, and so there's only a few things and a few times and you have to react quickly and you can't call somebody, but you know, if something happens like, you know, the glenoid cracks in a reverse shoulder, a really thin glenoid wall or something like that, you know, you got time, you could just call somebody in that situation. So I'd, I'd advocate for picking up the phone. And I think you've mentioned it, but you know, that it's that preoperative preparation to try to think about these complications ahead of time and what's going to happen the what next you know, you know, from, from our place, you in the technique conference, that's what it's all about is micro analyzing every potential thing that can go wrong. Um, Mike Knudsen, you joined your academic practice at, at the University of Minnesota, a resident, a second year resident comes into your case and they want the knife. When, where, what, and how, how do you manage the hungry millennial learner? <laughs> well, I learned this from you 
Um, but I mean, it's really, it's really important. Millennials just want to understand the why. Okay. So if it's a really tough revision case, if you can sit down and explain to this junior resident as to why they're not going to get the knife in this case, but you can get them involved in other ways, they'll understand and they'll be open to it. However, when it's a lesser, more simpler case, I think really parsing out with your, with your learners what aspects of the case they're most interested in being a part of, and then helping them do some aspect of that case when you're first starting out is doable. And I would encourage you to do it because we were all in their position at some point. But if you're gonna join an academic practice, you have to be willing and able to do some teaching from a surgical standpoint. And so you just have to decide how you're gonna do it. And I think through thorough expectation setting, uh, you can do that in a way where everybody leaves the OR happy and the case didn't take 14 hours. John Sperling, I've got a fellow and he really, he or she needs more reps. But I've got, a, I've got an OR day tomorrow, John, where I've got 10 cases and two rooms scheduled. And I know I have to, you know, I just got to keep things moving. How do I manage that? What, what do I do? I think Mike said it really well. I think the expectations, and I think you have to plan ahead that way. So it's the days perhaps when you have less number of cases on, you, those are the days to really ensure to have the patients to take them through the cases, through the different steps. So when you get to the day that you have a huge number of cases on, they've built up that efficiency and they can do a part of it, but they don't slow you down as much. So you have to plan ahead based on the individual days and build up to that. Great. Mike Ryway, a kind of a practical question about the OR, about op notes. Um, do you make templates? Do you dictate after each case? Do you dictate at the end of the day? Um, do you avoid boilerplate templates? What are your hospital requirements? Take us through that topic. Yeah, so it's it's a mixed bag for me a little bit there, um, Bill. So for, for me, um, I do uh, dictate for sort of the infrequent cases, um, uh, but you know, there's several cases like reverse shoulder, total shoulder replacement and rotator cuff that I have templates for. But the key really here is, is you know, it, it shouldn't just be a template and, and everything's, you know, cut and dry and, and done. You know, um, I have an operative finding section where I actually, you know, type in the specific findings. And look, if you do research, you just can't, you can't have boilerplate templates. You got to have specifics to each case and you got to make sure that you, you follow everything very closely. Um, for instance, for my total shoulder template, I make sure I put whether I did a peel, I do an osteotomy, um, you know, rotator cuff, I dictate the, the number of anchors, the type of anchors and, and the type of repair and things of that nature. So I, I think it's a mixed bag. You know, my hospital requires us to have everything done within a week after surgery, but I try to do it really to just like, you know, um, you know, right after the case, uh, when it's a dictation, otherwise you can, you can forget some of the details. John Sperling, do you ever dictate not after every case? I really try also, I agree with Mike. I think that's a good point, particularly as you start to do more and more complex revisions and it's fresh in your mind. So having that detail in there will really help you when you need to interpret that post-operative x-ray and if something doesn't look quite right. So that detail and information is really, really helpful. I'll tell you from, uh, you know, if you don't dictate after the case and especially if you're doing multiple cases in the day, uh, it is really rough. It's a, it's a bad day. And I see this as a chair when faculty don't do dictations and then they go back and try to do them retro. It's, it's not good. It's not yep. pretty. And from a medical legal standpoint, it's really rough. So best advice is do it right away. Uh, Ranjan Samar, we're about to switch topics to research. Any questions that you would either, uh, that you guys would like us to cover uh, for the OR? Well, Dr. Levine, anything else that you might uh, wish to discuss amongst your panel regarding boards collection, which is right around the corner? You've touched upon it during so far. Anything else? Any pearls? Okay, so Mike Ryway, board collection. Did you change your practice the day after your board collections was over, or did you try to be a, the same surgeon throughout the first 18 months and then thereafter? There was one thing I changed. It was uh, reverse for fracture. So I didn't do any reverse for fracture. And of course, this is like, you know, eight, nine years ago. Um, I did no reverse for fracture, you know, during my board collection period. As soon as um, that switched over, I did reverse for fracture. 
Uh, so, and I, I wasn't sure how the, the board would feel about that at that point in time. I think we're, we're well beyond that now. So, um, but I think that was, that was it. I also was, um, one thing I did do during board collection that I don't do now, and maybe I should, is uh, I sent certified letters and things like that um, when someone was sort of lost a follow up. I've let that go at this point, um, you know, but uh, maybe, maybe it's something I should be doing, but, but I haven't done that. And Mike Knudsen? Yeah, I really tried not to. So I tried to stick with my principles and stick by my guns right from the day that I started practice, and I tried to continue that through board collection. And I've tried to continue that through and beyond. I maybe get a little bit less tight on some of my indications after board collection is finished, meaning I don't require them to complete a full three months of physical therapy if they're really struggling. I don't make them go through an injection if, if they're very clearly arthritic and super painful, et cetera. But at the same time, I, I've really tried to stick by my guns um, before and after board collection. I think that makes you a better surgeon if you are acting like you're under the gun the whole time. Um, and it really tightens up your indications. Great. All right, we're gonna switch to research. Keys to success. Mike Knudsen, we don't have a database where I'm joining. How the hell do I collect data? How do I become a, a you know, I wanna help to contribute to, you know, uh, ad, answering the questions that John Sperling asks, answers all the time. Absolutely. Well. I mean, if you're joining an academic practice and they don't have a database, I would strongly advocate that you start that process as soon as you arrive, uh, or if not before. You want to start building the momentum and the energy to go towards getting the database eventually. But that is a lot of work and it takes a lot of moving parts to get there. So in the meantime, you need to work with your director of clinical informatics in order to find out what uh, tools that you can use in your office setting that you can actually have printed out. So whether it's the ASCS score for the shoulder or for the elbow, quick dash for the elbow, SST for the shoulder, you gotta figure out what you have access to and what licensing you need for those different survey tools so that you can actually print those out and have your patients fill them out so that they can be scanned into the medical record. Um, and that takes some work also. But getting that consistent across your different sites will be a challenge. And I really encourage you when you have more time early in your practice to start that machine working that direction sooner rather than later. John Sperling, we've got the world's best database. How do I choose impactful research? And one thing, one little trick I've learned over the years, Bill, that I think was helpful when I first started out was actually talking to some of my hip and knee colleagues trying to find out, you know, what are the burning questions that they're asking? And it was amazing and interesting how many things that they had actually solved or looked at that we had not yet looked at in the shoulder. So I think I'd encourage folks starting out, find out what are the hot topics that other specialties are looking at. And you may find really good opportunities to explore things that other people haven't done. That's awesome. Great advice. Mike Ryway, I'm in private practice, but I want to contribute to research. I want to you know, continue advancing in ASCS. How do I do that if I, I don't have an academic machine around me? Yeah, that can be hard. Um, you know, private practice is, is definitely different than the academic setting, but the first thing you need to start with is uh, sort of that infrastructure that we were talking about, the database. Um, make sure that you're collecting data. Um, you've got to set that up and whether you are, you know, hiring a company to do that, um, you know, there's multiple companies that you can do or just getting the you know ASES scores, the quick dashes, uh, the simple shoulder tests, uh, VAS pain. Just making sure you have that, so that when you do, you know, start the research, you can go back to that data. Uh, that's critical. Um, number two is is staffing. You know, it's it's hard to do by yourself if you're in clinical. You know, if you're in clinical practice and you're super busy, um, but sometimes you may be able to have a, a research nurse from the hospital uh, to be able to work with you. Um, and then finally, um, funding. How do you fund research uh, in private practice? That's really difficult too. Um, your hospital may be able to help you, uh, your own group. Um, there's a lot of different unique models that are out there in private practice um, from you know, a taxed model to um, ancillary income feeding research um, and, and even grants. So, um, so you know, there's a lot to talk about there. You probably have a separate lecture on that in academics um, and, and private practice and how you do it. But uh, for me, those are the three keys. Thanks. 
Okay, I'm going to ask you all three this so you can think about this question. I'll start with Mike Knudsen. We're going to go from fresh to mid to senior. Uh, I'm new to practice, Mike. How the hell do I manage office, OR, research, and family? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's really important to understand that you have to just be very intentional with your time and how you allocate it. Because when you're starting out in practice, your clinical volume will be slow. So you really want to take the time to form those connections with your patients, with all of the other providers in your, in your team and your network, with your physical therapists. Um, you really want to build that clinical machine. You want to start to build your research machine. You really want to start to build your OR volume. And you want to make sure that you're taking really good care of patients, but then you want to make sure that you're setting intentional time away for personal life, family, and taking good care of yourself. Don't forget. You want to make sure that you are getting exercise and you are pursuing hobbies also. You just have to be intentional and allocate your time appropriately and making sure that you have clear boundaries within your own life. So Mike, you're now in practice five to 10 years and you keep having another kid every two years. Uh, not that I know that from experience. Uh, how do you manage it, Mike? You, you know, you and Molly have got unbelievable family, but yeah. you also have done great with your career. How, how do you do it all? Well, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's the favorite part of my whole day and my whole life is getting home and, and seeing the family and hanging out, you know, um, to me, that's just what makes life fun. So you got to find whatever it is that's your priority, your why, you know, why do you, um, you know, do what you do? And for me, I just enjoy family. So I, I find, I carve out time for that. I try to be home at five and we have dinner together and, you know, I put the kids to bed at eight and then I might, you know, hit the computer for a little while. Um, and that's kind of what I, what I do sometimes. So, uh, but I think just finding, you know, the priority of what it is that you love, you know, what is it that drives you? Um, if research drives you find time for research, if family is what's driving you, um, make sure you make time for that. You know, just, you know, the things that make you happy are the things that you really need to focus on. And, um, you know, your career will always be there. You focus and do do your best always in that, that capacity, but um, find the time for the things that make you make you have fun. And John, you know, as the senior states person here, it, you get busier and busier. You get asked to go to more conferences. You get asked to do more book chapters and more, you know, invited things. Uh, how do you how do you manage all that, John? I think one thing, Bill, I think over time, I think as you start out and your career matures, I think having good mentors really helps quite a bit. I've been fortunate to have a number of them where I could see what they've done in terms of how do they manage the practice, the research and traveling, but also their family. And taking bits from different mentors can be also extraordinarily helpful. So for me, as I've gone along in my career, I think having those mentors, talking to those mentors and trying to learn from them and perhaps try to avoid some of the mistakes that they've made and that they're honest about telling you about can be enormously helpful. Bill, how about for you? Love to get your thoughts on this one. This is always a tough one. Yeah, I, I love it when people ask me about work-life integration. That's, um, well, part of it is that if you don't sleep, it's a lot easier. So that's always number one. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. I learned a lot from Jack Flynn. He and I did a, a ICL at the Academy for many years and he gave a talk on work-life integration and I always credit him for this. But what he says is, and this is what I recommend to all my fellows and residents, is get your, get your kids schedule for at least three months or six months in advance, get your spouse's schedule uh, if they've got a busy schedule as well. And every single thing that needs to, that you need to be there or want to be there that goes in your schedule and you tell your secretary, office coordinator, nothing will supersede that event because it's really hard to, to cancel surgery and office next week for your kid's recital or baseball game or basketball game. But if it's on the schedule for three months, then nothing else supersedes it. So I was like the only dad last year at my daughter Claire's you know, JV basketball games. And I was at every single one of them and I just rearranged my schedule, but that, that takes purposeful uh, management. Uh, but as long as you're thoughtful about it, I think you can do it. Uh, but that's, I think that's critical is to, you know, get your schedules and then make that your priority. That's what I've done, John. That's a great tip, Bill. Thank you. Sure. Great tip. 
All right, so if I could do it all over again, what would I change starting out my practice? So thinking about this, Mike Ryway, we're going with you first. That's a, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, looking back introspectively, like when I first started, um, the things that would just absolutely kill me were the complications. I mean, I would literally, for a week straight, just be thinking about that complication incessantly. And it, I mean, it really affected me. I think personally, I was, I was definitely in a situation where, you know, I, I was, you know, down on myself for having a complication and, um, and everybody has them, you know, and I've learned to sort of live with that. I don't like them, you know, and, and believe me, I, I try to prevent them and I try to make sure they don't happen, but um, it used to really dominate kind of my thinking. And, um, you know, that, that was, um, that was important for me to, to sort of change and it's, it's changed and it's been a definite positive for me. So, um, you know, I think in some way, just making sure that you don't um, overdo it uh, when you have a complication, just learn from it, move on, uh, get better from it, but um, don't, you know, bring it home. Uh, that, that's something that I think I would change. Mike Knudsen, you haven't been in practice that long, but in thinking about it, is, is there something you would do differently now knowing what you know? Uh, I think that one of the things is very subtle, very relatively small thing that I wish that I would have started doing differently. And I've just recently started doing more and more of is sending small personal notes within my own um, EMR system to the referring providers who are sending patients to me. Um, it's just a nice little personal touch and it helps you kind of build this sense of community with the other providers. And it helps because they are more willing and more interested in sending more patients to you if you make small personal connections with them. Um, and I really was purposeful and intentional about doing that with my therapists in my non-operative sports docs, but I'm talking about the primary care docs in your community. Making those connections early on, I wish I would have done that a little bit more aggressively early on to build a better, more robust referral network. Yeah, it's so important, isn't it, Mike? That's, that's your lifeline. You know, that, those are the folks that you, you want on your team. Um, John Sperling? I think it's a small thing, but I think it, it's made a big difference. I actually did not have a PA for my first three years in practice. And in retrospect, once I got a PA, it really made a huge difference. It helped for education. So the residents and fellows are in the room with me seeing the patients rather than doing a lot of the paperwork, which is huge. There's a continuity to the practice. So as residents rotate off the service, there's someone there who understands things. And then as our patients get sicker and more complex, my practice I'd say 30% of the people I operate on now are on Coumadin, Plavix, a blood thinner. If they're booked out four months, who manages it? Who makes sure they're off of it? So having a PA, someone trusted that you have a relationship with for 5, 10, 15 years has enormous benefits to your practice. And I wish I would have had that earlier on. Yeah, it's, those are great, great points. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I, I hope our fellows have, have gotten as much out of this as I have. Uh, I've, I've learned so much from the three of you, and it, it's really been enlightening. I think these are the things that, you know, what we've hopefully provided for our fellows uh, tonight uh, are some of the building blocks to try to make your transitions uh, a lot easier uh, as you go out and start practice. Uh, I think this will serve as a nice template for you to to look back at and review this. This is recorded by ASCS and these, all of these uh, sessions are available. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes left. If anybody has any questions, uh, please put them in the chat room. If you don't have any questions, then I think Ranjan and Samar will probably have at least one or two questions and then we'll finish promptly on time. And really thank Mike, Mike and John uh, for your commitment to education, your mentorship of your own fellows and residents uh, and uh, really an uh, unbelievable night. I'm, I'm really proud of uh, to have been here with you three. It's been a blast. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks very much. And thanks for organizing this, Bill. Very well done. Appreciate it. Ranja and Samer, any final questions that you'd like that we didn't cover? No, I think this has been a terrific uh, panel. Thanks for taking the lead. Um, love the roundtable discourse. Fantastic. Thank you. So thank you everybody for participating. Uh, it's been an amazing session. I've learned a lot. And I hope you all did. Um, next week as a teaser is going to be uh, billing and coding for shoulder and elbow surgery. It's the third of our series on practice management. And uh, I know all of us will be tuning in and learning as much as we possibly can. Thank you everyone and have a good night. Stay safe.
Have a good night. Thank you. Take care, Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Stella. Thank you.